Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Today we are back on the Multifix tool post project for my Grizzly lathe. I have the casting for the solid tool post riser back from Clark at Windy Hill Foundry. So today we're gonna to get that machined and install it on the lathe. Let's get started. These are the castings that I received from Clark over at Windy Hill Foundry. He ended up making a second one because he wasn't happy with the quality of the first one. But honestly, I think both of these are fine and either one would work. In the first casting here, you can see that it is a little bit sunken in on the bottom. And the reason for that is that the two risers that he used in the casting weren't quite sufficient to feed the volume. You can see the second casting has a much larger round riser in the middle. And as a consequence, there's a little bit less sinking in of the casting on the bottom. But in reality, I've got a hundred thousandths of extra material on the bottom and on the top of these to take off. So I really don't think it's going to be an issue. You can see that the parting line here on the side is pretty clean. Clark already cleaned that up before heat treating and it looks really good, but I probably will grab a grinder and do a little bit of fettling just to make sure we have a nice smooth surface so we can take some measurements just to try to align the castings to the machined features. Hey, look at that. I'm wearing boots. You know, I'm all about the safety. To fettle this, I'm just using a two inch Rolock flap disc on a right angle electric die grinder. And I find that this does a pretty good job as long as you don't have too much material to remove. If there were a lot that needed to come off of this, I would be using a larger angle grinder. Now there really isn't much here, but I am gonna be using calipers to measure so I can figure out how much material to take off of each side. So I just wanna make sure there's nothing here that's gonna unduly influence those dimensions. This is actually pretty clean, so I think we're ready to go. We have to start machining somewhere, and I think the most logical place to start on this particular casting is to machine the bottom flat and establish a planar surface that we can reference everything else off of. I'm clamping in the vise here with a couple of strips of copper because the sides of the casting are irregular and they are not parallel. There's casting draft on this, and you can see I have a couple of parallels under the bottom to keep it elevated off the bottom of the vise. Now I know a half inch end mill is not the most efficient way to do this, but if I use something bigger like a fly cutter or a face mill, it is just going to throw cast iron all over my shop. So I opted to just do this with a small end mill so all the chips will just stay right here on the mill table. Having verified that we're at least pretty close to level, I will touch the tool off here and then we'll raise the mill table 50 thou and take a pass. I really was not sure how this was going to behave. I was worried there might be hard spots in the casting or that my work holding might not be rigid enough, but none of that ended up being a problem. This thing just cut like butter. It did not complain. It just sliced right through. I went around the perimeter first with the tool cutting in towards the surface to try to reduce the burrs that were raised. In the end, with cast iron, that doesn't really matter, but I just went back and forth here and took the entire surface down 50 thou. You can see it didn't quite clean up yet. There is a little bit of sinking in there, but we have 100 thou to take off, so we'll go ahead and take the other 50 and see where we end up. I really like the chips that this end mill is giving off. They're nice and big, and there's very little dust, and they just come right up with the vacuum. You can see that we didn't quite clean up that surface, but this thing is going to have full bearing on the cross slide of the lathe, and so a little wane in the surface is not going to matter at all. This is good to go. Now that we've got one flat machined surface, we'll put that against the fixed jaw of the vise, set the part on another copper strip, and then clamp it in the vise using a piece of aluminum TIG rod. The TIG rod will crush and make up for any irregularities in the casting and make sure that that machine surface is flat and square against the fixed jaw. The drawing specifies a finished overall width and I would like to take that equally off of each side so that the curves of the casting line up with the machine surfaces. So I went ahead and just measured the part with calipers and I am taking half of the material off of the first side. There's really no point in measuring it because we would just be measuring against a raw casting on the other side. So I just touched off and I'm just taking half of the material and we will see where we end up.
Now that we have a second machine surface, we'll put that down on the bed of the vise and clamp it back in here, still with the aluminum rod since the top is not machined yet. And now that we actually have the one side machined, we can start taking measurements to come to our finished dimension. I'm using a height gauge here, just sitting on the bed of the matched vise here on the other side. And that will allow me to very easily take measurements of the height of this workpiece and I will just whittle it down until I get to the dimension on the drawing. Now that first measurement was not going to be super accurate because I was measuring off the cast surface, but now we have a machine surface to measure, so I can measure it, figure out exactly how much I need to take, raise the knee, and take the rest in one pass. And we'll take one final measurement, see how we did. The final dimension is supposed to be 3 inches, 780, and it looks like we are 1,000 under, 3 inches, 779. That is going to be just fine for this application. Now that we have two parallel machined sides on this, we can just go ahead and clamp the workpiece in the vise like we would any other piece of stock on top of a set of parallels. And note that I have one end of the part sticking out past the end of the vise jaws so that I have access to machine that in this setup. Just measure the overall thickness with a 4-inch caliper. Uh, pro tip, the 4-inch caliper will fit underneath the head of the milling machine, so that can be super convenient for applications like this. I know about how much I need to take off, so I'll just take half of that in the first pass here. And I have dispensed with being timid now that I know I have solid work holding and I can see what this end mill can do. In fact, it could probably go quite a bit faster than this. Now, I do want to leave about five thousandths of an inch excess material on this so that I can grind it later if I want. So I'll just take one more measurement, add on my five thou, and take the rest of the material in another pass. The most important and most visible alignment on this casting is going to be where the tool post mounts. So we want to make sure that the hole is exactly in the center of this boss. So I'm just using my wiggler here and I'm moving this around by eye and trying to line up and find the exact center here. This is a little bit fiddly of a process. Now the top of this isn't necessarily exactly round, at least I don't want to assume that. So I'm checking the front and the back, and I'm checking the two sides to make sure that they're even. And then once I get that to the point where I think it looks even by eye, I'll bring in a dial indicator and just go ahead and run this around. And it turned out I was within a thousandth of an inch just by eye with the wiggler. I really didn't need to use the indicator at all. Now that I've got the DRO centered up where that bolt hole is going to be, I'll go ahead and center up the wiggler and use it to probe the end dimensions where I intend to machine the casting, and just make sure that those line up with the curves of the cast surface where I expect them to. And these look pretty good. So let's get rid of the wiggler, bring in a drill chuck, and make a hole. This is a 2764 drill, which is the tap drill for 1 half 13, and those are the threads that I decided to put in the top of this. If you make one of these for your lathe, you can use any metric or imperial thread you feel like or that will work well with your tool post. I love how this cast iron drills. It is just nice and smooth. There's no voids in it. It makes a nice chip. It's just a pleasure to work with. Messy, but a pleasure to cut. Now I'm just going to go ahead and power tap this half 13. The mill has the capacity to do it. I might as well. This is a three flute spiral point tap. So I went ahead and drilled the hole all the way through the casting so I can just push this in. It'll push the chips right out the bottom of the hole with no drama at all. I know, I know, cast iron dust and compressed air. I shouldn't do it, but I did. While I still have the part in this setup, I'm going to go ahead and machine the end here. I'm just using a 5 8 inch two flute end mill that has the rigidity and the reach that I need to get this entire surface. 
and I'm not doing any kind of measurements, I'm just using the DRO. I just added half the diameter of the end mill and I'm driving straight to the dimension and that is just gonna have to be good enough. To do better with this, I would really need to measure off of the position of that threaded hole and I just don't wanna screw around with it. This is really just visual alignment. I thought for a long time about how I wanted to machine these holes in the corners and I decided to just go ahead and do it all in this same setup so that the dimensions would be more accurate. I'm just establishing some flat spots here in the corners where I need to drill using this same four flute roughing end mill. This is a center cutting end mill so I can plunge down and I'm just plunging in far enough to establish a full flat spot for the drill. This is a nine millimeter drill. This is clearance for an eight millimeter screw. And I'll just go ahead and push these through in all four corners. Of course, since I'm doing this all in the same setup, I can just drive to the coordinates shown on the drawing using the DRO. Nice and easy. Now to cut the counter bores, I'm using an eight millimeter piloted counter bore. So I checked and the curvature is such that I can get the pilot engaged in the hole before the flutes hit the casting. So it'll just guide itself in. It's a little bit rough until you get at least two flutes cutting. Once you have two cutting, especially once you have three, it just goes like butter and cuts a nice, neat counter bore. And I'll just run these deep enough in all four corners to capture the screw heads. With all the holes cut, the only remaining operation is to flip it around and machine it to length. We'll just use the same 5 8 two flute end mill and slice it off, take measurements as we go, and bring it to the final dimension. Let's see if it fits on the lathe. This is the 3D printed prototype that we started with. And here's the cast iron part we just machined. Looks like a pretty good fit to me. Don't feel any rock at all, so I think we machined it flat. Let me grab some eight millimeter screws here and let's screw it down and see how it fits. Looks like the screw holes are lining up. <laughs> That's a good sign. I'll just go ahead and align this by feel, just running my finger along the edge. It's designed to fit exactly against the edges of the cross slide. Get that lined up as square as possible and cinch it down. Now I did spend a few minutes deburring this off camera. I just used a carbide burr in my NSK pencil grinder and just took all of the sharp edges off and the result is really nice to the touch. Let's grab the multi-fix tool post and see how it fits. That was the whole point of this endeavor in the first place. Just line it up here by eye and try to get it as centered as I can on the boss. I'm really interested to see where the left hand side of the tool holder lands. I really intended for that to line up with the left side of the cross slide and the casting just to make sure that we didn't uh, compromise our ability to reach around the chuck. And this looks pretty good. Of course, we won't be able to tell for sure until we attach it permanently, and that is going to require making a post to mount this on. It'll just thread into the casting and fit the recess in the tool post body. And then, of course, we'll drill and ream a hole for a pin to make sure that the tool post doesn't rotate in operation. I have a piece of alloy steel that I will use to turn that post, and we'll work on that in a future video. But for now, this looks like we are definitely on the path. That's it for today, and I am really pleased with the results. This is the first time I have ever designed a casting, and it turned out exactly the way I imagined it. Now, I got a comment on the pattern making video telling me that I could have just put a block of material in the chuck on the lathe, used the compound to turn a conical feature on it, and boom, tool post riser done. And that I wasted a whole bunch of time and money messing around with CAD in the computer and 3D printing and metal casting when there's a much better way to do it. And while I'll admit that putting an eight pound hunk of steel off center in my small lathe would have comedic value, I didn't waste my time. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I got something in the end that I'm truly proud of that will make me smile every time I use it. And that's why I do this. If you also enjoy wasting time and money on stuff like this, let me know about that down in the comments. I've had a couple of people ask me if I'm gonna make these castings available. I've been talking to Clark over at Windy Hill Foundry, and that is absolutely something that we can do if there is enough interest. So let me know down in the comments. Thank you for watching.